Can you see that, Sonia? Perfect. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get started here at 7.03. So my name is Kayla Miner. I am the communications coordinator with Foothills Forage and Grazing Association. Um, FFGA is a nonprofit producer-driven group that was formed in 1972 that addresses issues, ideas, and innovations for forage and livestock producers in the South Central Alberta. FFGA brings producers together by finding profitable and regenerative ways to produce uh, forages and livestock. So we cover 13 counties all the way down to Waterton up to Olds. Um, we, we partner with our sister associations across the province to host educational events, conferences, and demonstration projects. Um, so. Here at FFGA, we offer many programs such as extension events, workshops, conferences, and webinars. Um, we offer environmental farm plans to producers as an environmental awareness tool, uh, as well as producer funding updates. On our network of platforms, we offer a wider range of information, such as upcoming events, webinars, new and interesting articles, um, and promotion of the livestock and forage industry. Um, to become a member, you could visit our website. Membership gives you access to a network of innovation, forward-thinking producers, our monthly newsletter and discounts to our events, workshops, tours, and webinars. Right. Um, well, I guess I did go back one slide. So anyways, I would like to give an update on a few upcoming events we are excited for, which includes our Creating Drought Resilience by Harnessing Nature's Engineers uh, with Jay Wild, a Native Pasture Renovation Workshop, a Johnson and Sioux Bioreactor Workshop, and the Southern Alberta Grazing School for Women. We also have a Ranching for Profit school coming up in the fall. So keep an eye on our website and social media for, for more upcoming events. So we are doing this webinar in partnership with Connect First Credit Union. Um, he will, uh, I will pass the mic to Chris Herman. He's with Connect First and he will give you a quick, quick update on some things that they are up to. And then we will get to water. Um, I will ask that if you guys have questions, just to type them in the chat so you don't forget, and then we'll go over them at the end of the at the end of the webinar. Um, be sure to put whose question is for who, if it's for Len or Joe or Sonia, and then we can address that at the end. Also, I just want to make note that if you're coming in from my email, you might be coming in as Kayla Miner. So try and uh, rename yourself with the three little dots at the top. Right, um, and then we know who you are. So, thank you. Thanks, Kayla. Let me get my screen up here. All right, um, so hi everyone. I'm Chris Herman, uh, Manager of Agriculture Banking at Connect First Credit Union. Uh, Connect First was formed back in 1939 when uh, four neighbors came together to fund a loan to uh, buy a neighbor, help a neighbor buy a washing machine. So for more than 80 years, we've continued to focus on supporting our neighbors across Alberta. Uh, Connect First currently, we have 40 branches across Southern and Central Alberta. Uh, with 26 being in rural communities. Uh, we recently merged with Service Credit Union and we'll be adding close to 80 more rural serving communities uh, spanning across the province. And because of where locations fall, uh, we support members from the surrounding communities and counties, which nearly doubles the reach of our home branch uh, communities alone. And to say all that, uh, we love and we know rural Alberta. Um, my egg team lives and works right alongside our producers in our smaller centers in the province. So it is our goal to provide the services and products that uh, Alberta produ producers need and to invest in the future of egg production in Alberta through supporting community events and uh, agriculture education both for the future of agribusiness and for people working in agribusiness today. Um, I'd like to thank Foothills uh, Forage and Grazing Association for working with us to offer 
important learning sessions such as this one so we can help our producers in Alberta be successful and sustainable regardless of what Mother Nature and sometimes legislation throws our way. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Connect First, there should be a QR code up on your screen. So feel free, it will take you to our website. And my contact information is also there. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. And with that, I think uh, let's get started. So um, I'll introduce you to Joe, our first speaker. So Joe is a agriculture water specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation, working out of the Lethbridge office. Uh, he's worked in that role for the past 25 plus years, helping agriculture producers with water supply, water quality, water distribution, beneficial management practices, and water funding programs. So Joe, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, okay, I'll see if I can get my screen up here now. Um, see if I can share this screen. And let's see, let's see if that works. Actually, no, I want to do this one so that I can see it because it's I've got it over to the side. So, okay, everyone can see that. Sorry, I'm I'm old enough. I'm techno illiterate here. Let's see how does that? Nope, that's not how I, how I want to do it. Okay, everyone see that? Not yet, Joe. Still no? see you. Oh, oh, wait. Hmm. Can't see that either. Ah, what am I doing? I had it. I had it earlier. Let's see. I don't know how to get rid of it. Um, what am I doing here? Did you press the, the share screen thing at the bottom there? Uh, I can't find it now. It's buried behind my presentation. How do I? Sonia, do you, you're better at explaining. <clears throat> what are you seeing, Joe? Like when you hit share okay. screen? Okay, there. Okay, now I'll yep. see. I'm seeing Chris, actually. That's what I see when I'm sh share screen. Chris, I, oh. that's good. Um, just wait. Oh. Okay. There you go. Yep, we it, got you, Joe. Uh, Okay, now I see myself. So, <laughs> so uh, now I got to bring up the presentation somehow. It's, a, it's the PowerPoint at the bottom in your taskbar, right? Uh, yep. Perfect. Yep. So, so, okay, now I have to, but I can't see the the taskbar now to uh, to start my presentation. <clears throat> Anybody? Know how to can you go? Of... Can you, Joe? If you go to bottom of the screen, yeah, where your mouse is, just a little bit yep. further down. Uh, yep. now up in that light gray bar, just I'll up a little it. bit. Yeah, yeah. Now over, right, 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 right. Do you see kind of the what looks like a screen? Uh, so yeah, okay. yeah. Keep going right. Keep going right. Just go right. Here. I gotta go back over here. Yeah, right there. There we go. Um, and uh, I think now. Um, just wait. Uh, and now, if you hmm. click on display settings at the top in the center. Display settings. Yeah, top, settings. up. Uh, oh, I wonder if you can't see it. See, I can't see it. It's behind, behind the, uh, the Zoom taskbar. Can you give me remote control real quick and I can do it for you? Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Don't click anything. Okay. Oh, why won't let me do this? Oh, no. So it should be swap screen because I all I need to do is swap it. The, the actual PowerPoint full presentation is over on my other screen. Okay. So if, if you see a swap 
screen. Uh, it won't let me click it. It won't let me click anything. Huh. Oh, yeah. Uh, hit close real quick, if you don't mind, Joe. Close. Yeah. yeah. Stop sharing, you mean? No, just close out in the top right corner. Yeah. I yeah. can't see. Right there. Just right click. there? Yeah. Okay. Um, should we? Sorry, everybody. Just one quick second here. Did we lose Joe? I think so, yeah. Ooh. Oops. Okay, Um. should we go with Len? Sure, yeah. Chris, do you want to give a quick update on who Len is? They sure can. While we wait for Joe there, we'll, we'll get Len up on, on the screen. Uh, so, Len Hingley is a irrigation specialist for Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation. Uh, he holds a master's degree of water security from the University of Saskatchewan and is a certified agriculture irrigation specialist with the Irrigation Association. In his current role, Len is responsible for the development, advancement, and support of Alberta's suite of irrigation scheduling tools and irrigation management practices to aid in the productive and efficient use of irrigation water in the province of Alberta. Additionally, Len partners with uh, external government departments and universities to facilitate irrigated research across Western Canada. So welcome, Len. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction, Chris. Um, yeah, let's see if I can make this work a little bit better. Sure. There. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Yes, I am an irrigation specialist uh, for Alberta. Sorry, I Len, I don't. Did you share a PowerPoint? Yeah, I did. Okay. We're not seeing it. <laughs> Oh, okay. What are you seeing? Uh, just you talking right now. <laughs> just me again. Oh, okay. Okay, let's try this. We see a frog now. Oh, there we go. Yep. Got her? Yep, you bet. Okay. And you can see everything. You don't see a little bar on the side with my picture and everybody else's stuff there, or are you are you good? No, nope. we can see you talking and the PowerPoint. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's start. Um, again, thanks for the introduction, Chris. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about managing irrigation with limited water availability. And I kind of give you a breakdown of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I know it was a part of the opening if, if you looked at kind of the literature that came with with this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk to you about those three principles. They're the key to irrigation management. And then after that, I'm going to get into, um, uh, well, <laughs> I did add one thing that I hadn't listed there because I knew there were some dry land uh, producers here. So I did uh, add some irrigation, well, it's not irrigation, but water management for irrigated lands, or I mean, non-irrigated lands. We'll talk about that. And then I'll get into uh, the, the core of my presentation, which is deficit irrigation, as well as uh, irrigation systems. So without further ado, let's uh, move on to the uh, first slide. So the rate and amount and timing of irrigations are um, uh, key components of irrigation management. And so that's why I like to bring them up to begin with, to kind of frame what irrigation management is and uh, why we do what we do. And we do what we do is because of these three key critical components. So rate is the amount of water that we apply at or below the infiltration rate of our soils. And it is driven by texture. So as you can see here, I have a relative particle size, a coarse sand, a medium sand, a fine sand, 
a clay and a silt. So the largest particle size, of course, is your sand, which is uh, 0 0.05 to 2 millimeters. And then your smallest particle size is your clay, which is less than 0 0.002 millimeters. And that uh, it cannot be seen with the unaided eye. Um, so you certainly need like a microscope or something like that to see clay. Silt, you might be able to see it. And sand, uh, I know you've seen the sandy soil. You can definitely see a, a coarse sand without unaided vision. So why do we need that for infiltration? Well, uh, if you look at this table, I have soil type on the left, and then I have our basic infiltration rate on the right, 10 millimeters an hour. A sandy soil is, uh, is able to take in 30 millimeters an hour or more of water at any one point in time. And a clay is only able to take in one to five millimeters an hour. So there, there's quite a wide range of infiltration rates for our soils. These are, are this definitely isn't an exhaustive list of soil types on the left, but uh, I, I just give you a, a taste of what that looks like from sand to clay. And it's important uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, in this particular graphic, I have um, irrigation or infiltration rate, pardon me, in millimeters an hour on our y-axis and on our x-axis, I have time in minutes. And then the red line that you see there, that is our system application rate. And it's about 23 millimeters an hour. And then we have two soil types. We have a sandy loam and a clay loam. And most soils, actually all soils, will take water in very readily at the beginning. So it doesn't even matter if you have a clay or a sandy loam, it's gonna take water in at the beginning of that application. And then after about eight to 10 minutes, you're gonna see it sort of trend down and then we're gonna hit a, a steady state equilibrium. And that's what you see with that dotted line for sandy loam. So underneath that is our application rate. Um, sandy loam is able to take in 25 millimeters an hour. So as long as we want to apply water to our, our field, that sandy loam soil is going to take that water in. The clay loam soil, on the other hand, will only take water in up to about eight or nine minutes, and then we'll see ponding and runoff. The one problem about sandy loam, however, is if that sandy loam profile that we're looking at was full already, and we're still taking water in, what we're gonna see is water loss to depercolation. And so that depercolation means water moving by gravity through to through the root zone, excuse me, and then into the water table. So that's, that's kind of what's going on with infiltration and depercolation for two soil types. And this is what happens when we have improper application rates. Um, as you can see here, this is a, a pivot that's been stuck. And if it's not stuck, it's probably going to get stuck here sh very shortly. And it's in a, uh, a grass alfalfa mixed field in a low area. And so what can we do to mitigate this problem? Well, the one thing we could do is speed up the pivot so that uh, it's going by a little bit faster and we don't have that, that wetted diameter that's quite narrow over a shorter or longer period of time over one specific area. Another thing, we can set up a VRI system, which is a variable rate irrigation system. And what happens with that is we have it nozzled at the top uh, with the solenoid valve, and then that solenoid valve can control water coming on and off. And so we could shut it off in this location if it's, a, if it's a historically a low spot in the field. Um, another thing we can do is we put boom backs on and that uh, modifies our wetted diameter. So our, if our wetted diameter is larger, then we don't see that pawning. Another problem with this is outside of the fact that the pivot will get stuck and potentially drop a span or something like that, potentially, we, uh, we can lose the ability to irrigate on this field if that happened. And if we lose the ability to irrigate, we lose the potential yield that we may have. And one last thing um, with ponding, what you see is hypoxic conditions. So that soil profile is full, we don't have any air. And what happens when we don't have air for roots, the plant dies. And so those are some of the problems with not getting our application right. right. So let's get into amount. Amount is the amount of water that we apply to a soil volume 
And so we need to know the texture of that one, but we also need to know how much our soils will hold. And each soil holds water a little differently. On the left, we have a sand uh, on a, under a microscope. And on the right, we have a clay under a microscope. And if you look at this, you'll say, oh, okay, what, what has the most pore space here? Well, um, most people would say the sand, and, and it looks that way. Like we have larger pores, but that's not the case. Uh, we actually have more pore space with the clay soil. And uh, the reason we have more is because of the structure, the difference in structure. So that, that platy clay, or clay soil that you see on the right is the tightly packed plates and so the reason the infiltration rate is, is difficult through this because it has to go through this very torturous path to get through the soil. But as a result of the structure that we currently have, we were able to um, hold more water within that soil profile as opposed to the sandy soil, which allows water to flow through, but it won't hold any water. So on the left, we have our soil textural classes again. Um, and then on the right, we have our plant uh, available water holding capacity and millimeters and inches. Our loamy sand uh, holds 112 millimeters for a one meter profile, all the way down to a clay, which is 192, a uh, silty clay loam, which is 220, which is our highest uh, amount of water that can be held in the soil profile. And the reason for that is, is the clay will actually hold more water. It's just um, because of those suction forces within that soil profile, they won't release the water to the plants. So that's, that's what we have for our maximum plant available water holding capacity. And that available water holding capacity is the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point. So field capacity is basically, if I apply a bunch of water, so if I had a rainfall of say two inches or three inches and it fills up my profile, what I'm going to find is after about 24 to 48 hours, after gravity's had its chance to work, all the water will drop through that profile. And then whatever's left after gravity's had a chance to work is field capacity. The permanent wilting point is the point at which our plants can no longer extract water from that profile. So the difference between the two is our available crop water. Okay. So that available crop water is what we're looking for. Uh, we want to make sure that we target that. We want to make sure that we don't dip into permanent wilting point where we get stress. And actually below our manageable allowed depletion, 60%, say, uh, I would say uh, you're, you're going to put your plant into stress and you don't want to do that. All right. Lastly, I'll talk about timing. So this one is uh, critical. First, we talked about rate. Rate, again, texture dependent. Um, at or below the infiltration rate of the soil. So we need to know the texture. Um, and then the next one was amount. We texture as well as how much soil moisture we have and how much we can hold within that profile. And now we're going to throw in another component. So we know our texture. We know our soil moisture, where it's at. Now we need to know our plant water use. So how much is our plant going to use at any one point in time? And we want to make sure we optimize the amount of water that it's getting so that it can um, generate the best yields that we can get. So we do that by uh, monitoring evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is just one big word, two, uh, two other words kind of sandwiched together, uh, evaporation and transpiration. And evaporation is the water that is released from soil and plant surfaces, as well as open water. And transpiration is the amount of water that comes through your roots, through the xylem, to your plant leaves, and out through the stomata under the leaf. So these are just little pores that release water into the atmosphere for plant cooling. And there's four main attributes that drive evapotranspiration, and they are temperature. So with an increase in temperature, our evapotranspiration rates increase. Uh, wind, if we have a stronger wind, we have more evapotranspiration potential. Humidity, higher humidity actually decreases our evapotranspiration. And then sunlight, the more sunlight we have, the more potential for evapotranspiration as well. And we do this um, on a, a yearly basis using a Bowen ratio ener energy balance system. 
And I won't get into all the details about this because I think it's uh, maybe for your audience a little boring, but I can come back if there's questions at the end. But what the Bowen ratio is, is uh, uh, that uh, top equation there, B equals H over LE. And that's the Bowen ratio equals H, which is sensible heat flux over LE, which is your latent heat flux, or basically it's your ET. So H, which is our sensible heat, is just a change in temperature by one degree Celsius. And LE is a phase change, say from a, a liquid to a gas but when we're looking at water. And if you go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see ET equals RN minus G minus H uh, over, uh, and I won't even get into the density of water and latent heat and vaporization, but that's what we're looking for. We're looking for ET crop over a growing season. So this particular equipment, we run at 15 minute intervals. And so we have that ET value for 15 minute intervals. And then we collate that, and then we come up with a daily value. And then eventually we come up with an annual daily water use curve or crop water use curve. And that's what this looks like. So each crop has a different signature. It looks a little different. Uh, this one is a spring wheat crop, uses about 420 to 480 millimeters over a growing season. And uh, this is how it uses water. And of course, you would expect the beginning during emergence, um, we're going to have our lowest daily crop water use. And then once we hit July, our peak water use needs uh, hit around 7 millimeters a day before we drop off into ripening senescence into August and early September. Well, all of this uh, is done so that we can generate what's called a crop coefficient curve. So this crop coefficient curve is found by uh, using our ET crop that we just generated and dividing it by our ET reference. And so that's our highest potential yield that we're gonna get. And we use a crop called alfalfa for that. And the equation you see at the bottom below that, that uh, target, which is our aim product, is what we use to do that. And so when we have our ET crop and we divide it by our ET ref, we get a, a crop coefficient. And that crop coefficient looks like this. Um, basically, this is uh, a three-stage crop coefficient. We normally run a, a, a four, uh, fourth degree polynomial when we run our crop coefficients, but uh, this is adequate as well. And then we plug those crop coefficients into our irrigation scheduling tools like AIM on the left, uh, which is our flagship tool, our irrigation scheduler mobile, which comes to us through Washington State University. And it's a mobile app that you can use, which does very similar work that AIM does. And then lastly, our IRICAS model, which is our crop water usage calculator. And it, uh, it shows you your crop water use on a, a five-day basis for kind of common crops here in Southern Alberta. All right, now that we got the front end done, let's talk about managing water on non-irrigated lands. And I did mention I was gonna talk about this. Um, it wasn't something I'd, I told Kayla about initially, but I thought, you know what? Uh, I thought it was important to kind of mention some of these things before we, before we get into the irrigated side of things. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was stubble management. And some work from University of Saskatchewan through uh, Dr. Philip Harder. And he worked on crop stubble heights and making some adjustments there and, and to see what kind of effects crop stubble heights have on snow capture in the winter. And he found that increasing cover by 10% can reduce soil evaporation by 5%. And when we're looking at dry land, and specifically during drought years, this is this is critical. This is uh this is a big number. And not only that, during a dry year, there's data showing that 50% of the crop's growth is attributed to snow melt and winter moisture capture. And that is massive. So uh, during a wet year, of course, that value is, is reduced significantly. But during a dry year, uh, the more moisture you capture in the winter for your crop, the better. All right, next one is direct seeding. And I'm sure most of you um, are doing this, so you don't need a, a refresh. I'll go through this one quite quickly. Direct seeding increases your crop residue, of course. I'm sure you all know that. It increases your soil health by impacting your soil tilth positively, as well as your organic matter. 
This also conserves your soil moisture, leading to higher yield, yield potentials. And some of the work that Ross McKenzie has done, he said when um, soil moisture is high, you can lose a half an inch to one inch of soil moisture for every tillage pass that you take. So direct seeding is uh, certainly the way to go in a dry land setting where you're trying to conserve moisture. The next one is forecasting. And uh, I don't know how many people do this, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly an important task to, to run with uh, during the off season. And so what we do is we, we couple early season uh, soil moisture measurements. So we go out in our field and we auger a few holes. We wanna take a look at where our soil moisture is for that, uh, that crop coming in. And that crop coming in um, will of course have a different root zone or root profile. So you wanna make sure you look at that if it's a cereal crop, it'll be down to a uh, foot. I mean, sorry, one meter, three feet to four feet. And uh, oil seeds are very similar, but if you're looking at a, a pulse crop, it's a, a shallow rooted crop, which is around 60 centimeters. So you wanna make sure you look at that. Now, once you've done that, then uh, you wanna estimate how much potential precipitation you're gonna have moving into the growing season. And for our particular area here in southern Alberta, we're going to see around six to seven inches of, uh, of water. And that's an average, of course. Um, but uh, it's best to have an idea, again, with the amount of storage I have in my soil profile, added with kind of the average 67 inches, what does that look like? And I don't want to be applying fertilizer rates or foliar uh, fungicides uh, when, when I don't need to or at rates that I certainly don't need to. So those are things you'd want to maybe consider as well. Lastly is crop mix. And this is not conventionally a crop mix um, as you would think of a crop mix. This is um, kind of leading into the, the future years. So if I had a key crop or another pulse crop that's only uh, rooted to 60 centimeters, then the following year, I could say seed a cereal or canola crop that would root below that, right? So with cereal or canola, as I mentioned, they're down to about uh, three to four feet or uh, 1.2 meters. And then that would tap into the, the resources that this particular pea crop hadn't tapped into. And if, and if I had a cereal crop or an oil seed crop, then maybe I want to seed a sunflower crop or an alfalfa crop which uh, pulls water from a lower level yet, 180 centimeters for sunflower and over 200 centimeters for alfalfa. And then lastly, um, seeding rate and timing. And I, and I always suggest this, uh, seed as early as possible because it improves water use efficiency. And so we have our vegetative growth in cooler early spring um, excuse me, uh, which can lead to higher grain yield per unit water. And early seeding also contributes to total available sunlight for the crops, which is greater for early seeded versus later seeded crops because an effective canopy cover is active for longer uh, before the days start to shorten after June the 21st. Um, another piece to this is early seeding can also reduce heat stress so here's an example, flowering earlier. Uh, I had a canola crop and I seeded it, and then I wouldn't have to worry necessarily about flower abortion if uh, it's flowering in kind of the shoulder of the, the growing season. So kind of maybe mid to late June. Um, lastly, in drier than normal settings, uh, consider decreasing seeding rates to reduce plant populations for dry conditions because you don't want those plants competing for the, the limited resource that is there and that limited resource of course is your your soil storage water all right now let's talk about irrigation so we're going to talk about managing limited water on irrigated lands and this work, um, or this kind of spreadsheet work, was done by Ross McKenzie, uh, and you can find it. It's on Green News. I think it was released a couple of, a couple of months ago in March. But he and, and Shelley Woods came 
uh, together and came up with this graph that you see here. And we have a crop on the left and then approximate crop water use requirements in millimeters and inches on the right. And so each crop, of course, is going to have a, a different profile. Um, alfalfa is using the most water at 675 millimeters, potentially. Corn silage is not far behind with 650 millimeters. And then the rest of them kind of fill in with dry bean and pea being some of the, the lowest water users. So what he suggests in moving into a drought year, um, like the one we currently are in, and I know we're, we're getting a substantial moisture right now. And uh, Actually, there's something I did want to mention. Um, here in Brooks, we got 75, I think it was around 75 millimeters of water for our whole growing season last year. And that was from April 1st all the way to September 30th. And this year, we're already at 106. And, uh, and that was before the end of May. So we're, we're doing quite well. But that just shows you how, how terrible our season was last year. Anyway, um, this particular graph shows you our crop on the left. Uh, we have corn silage, wheat, potatoes, canola, and dry bean. And so this particular uh, producer has 20 fields. He's going to seed those uh, five different crops. And he wants to know, am I going to have enough moisture with the irrigation water allotment that I have? And that irrigation water allotment is 15 inches at this point in time in the EID. So we have a, a total crop water requirement uh, of 25 inches for corn silage, 18 for wheat, 22 for potatoes, 19 for canola, and 15 for dry bean. And then we look at what's stored in the spring, spring soil moisture storage. And we have three inches for a few crops and two for others. And then we look at our estimated growing season precipitation. I said six to seven. He reduced this considering he thought maybe, okay, it's going to be a dry year. Let's drop this a little bit. So he has five inches and four inches for some of the, the predicted uh, precipitation events that they're going to have. And so that gives you a net value. So what I'm doing is I'm I have my total crop water requirement and I'm subtracting my storage plus my estimated precipitation. And that gives me 17 inches for corn silage, 11 for wheat, 15 for potatoes, 13 for canola, and nine for dry beans. And that's not the real value. Uh, the real value is the gross irrigation water required because no efficient or no system is 100% efficient. So if I had a, a MISA system, it's about 20% less or 20% more in this case that I'm going to have to apply in order to get that 17 inches. And then my irrigation allotment. So I uh, subtract my, my gross from my irrigation allotment, and I get a surplus or a deficit. So for corn silage, I get a deficit of 5.5 inches of water. For wheat, it's uh, a surplus of two. Uh, potatoes, a deficit of three. And canola is about break even. And then down at dry beans, we're, we're plus four. So what do I do with this data? Well, maybe I shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't be uh, seeding as much corn silage as I am. Or maybe I want to move some water around. Uh, maybe wheat prices are really low and I want to move my, my wheat into corn silage. So I'd have a couple of those fields that I could do. I want to make sure that my potatoes get enough water, so I want to move my dry bean over to my potatoes. And you have to know each district will handle this a little differently. The EID answer uh, has a transfer amount of six inches per parcel, so that's that's what you can move. And that's all, so you can't add any more than that. So you can move it around. I'm not telling you how you do this, but it's a good idea to do it so you have it in your mind. If I'm only allowed 15 inches, how am I going to manage my, my irrigation management needs? All right, now let's get into our, our deficit irrigation strategies. So the first one I want to talk about is sustained deficit irrigation. And uh, it is defined as a reduced water volume as a percentage of crop evapotranspiration applied to the crop throughout the whole irrigation season. 
So what does that mean? <laughs> well, that means that what I'm doing is I'm reducing the amount of water that I'm going to apply through the whole irrigation season. So if my crop requires 100% of ET replacement, so that's 100% of all the water that's being transpired it needs back, then this is going to reduce that by a certain percentage, say 10% or 20% or 30% or 50%, whatever you want to do. And some people have done that. Um, I want to show you a case study here that was just done recently. This was done by Saad and his group in Egypt in 2023. And they did it on wheat. And uh, what they found was they found their highest net profit was recorded with their 100% of irrigation replacement. And of course, that makes the most sense, right? So when he had his other re reductions of 75% and 50% of irrigation replacement, they were they were they did profit as well. Uh, wheat growth and productivity significantly decreased under deficit irrigation, in which when you expect to see, and the amount of water used for production for one ton of grain increased decidedly for SDI versus 100% of irrigation replacement. SDI being sustained deficit irrigation. So what's that saying is basically if I give my crop all the water it needs, it's more efficiently going to produce yield than it would if I reduce the amount of water that I'm seeing. All right, the next one is called the regulated deficit irrigation. So regulated deficit irrigation was first proposed by Chalmers in 81. And this irrigation strategy reduces water applications during periods characterized by less plant sensitivity to water stress and, and minimal effects on yield. And there are two types of deficit irrigation approaches. I'll go through both of them. There's the stage-based uh, deficit irrigation and the partial root zone drying irrigation. So first of all, stage-based irrigation. Uh, this approach varies with growth stages. So what we're doing is we're, we're targeting different growth stages for uh, limiting water uh, applied. So we don't want to apply water um, at each one of these growth stages uh, the same way. So what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of water that we apply over a growing season. So what, they're, what they believe is that if I can target whatever, say, at emergence or tasseling or silking, then what I'm going to see is uh, it'll still be efficient. We're still going to generate yield, but I'm I'm going to be able to save water by doing it. So my water use efficiency increases. And there was a study done I wanted to review with you, and this was back in 2021 in Pakistan. One of the reasons I chose this study to show you is because it is a semi-arid climate similar to ours in Sind. And what this researcher did um, was he had seven treatments. Uh, the first treatment was a full irrigation treatment. And then he had six stages of wheat growth. So uh, these six stages were reduced by 50% at one point in time. So uh, the first one was reduced by 50%, the next 50, 50, and so on and so forth. And what they found is the water deficit at grain maturation stage enhanced water use efficiency with the least yield penalty. So what does that mean? It means basically I'm not going to see a reduction in yield or a significant reduction in yield if I reduce the amount of water they apply at uh, maturation. But if I did the same thing uh, during tillering, I would see the yard largest uh, reduction in yield. So. That's what they found uh, in winter wheat in this particular study. There's another one I wanted to touch on. This one is about optimizing. And so instead of just targeting one uh, time to kind of, or one growth stage to reduce the amount of water that we applied, this one um, by Wang in, in 2023 focuses on water productivity in maize. And what he did was he looked at optimizing the amount of water that we apply throughout the whole growing season. And at the beginning, we have 30 mils and then no irrigation. And then we're less than full irrigation, but we're still about 88% of full irrigation. And then full irrigation at 100%. And then lower limit of irrigation, uh, less than full irrigation uh, from milk to, uh, to ripening. 
at our, our six there. So the only time that we didn't um, reduce irrigation amounts here was at full irrigation between tasseling and milk stage. And so we wanted to make sure that we maintain transpiration uh, through that, that period of time to accumulate the most photosynthetic product uh, available. All right, um, this one is called partial root zone drying. <clears throat> and there's, there's two different strategies here. There's alternative or alternate and fixed. An alternate, basically, if you look at this image, uh, it's a citrus uh, tree, and we have water on at the, the right-hand side of this image, and then water off on the left-hand side of this image. And then we would apply water during that week on the one side, and then we would invert this moving forward to the next week. So we just are alternate back and forth. And then we'd have fixed, and fixed would basically just be where you see the blue on, on the right-hand side, that would get the water um, all the time, and the left-hand side of the image wouldn't get water at all during the growth period. I'm not gonna touch on the fixed one, but I am gonna touch on the alternate um, method. So there was a case study in 2022 that uh, published a review on partial root zone drying and its impact on crop yield. And there's some very positive results that came from this. Excuse me. Iran in 2003 and 2004 had a, a wheat crop that they did some research on and found a reduction of 42 and 39% of irrigation water without significant difference in yield. Turkey under sunflowers, 36% water savings. China, uh, approximately 35 increase, 35% uh, increase in water use efficiency based on, on yield by 41%. And in Peru, we saw uh, in a potato field the reduced water consumption by 32 to 54% without yield reduction. So what are the advantages of this? Um, it increases water use efficiency. You save up to 50% of the irrigation water without significant yield reductions. Minimizes leaching environmentally friendly, um, the disadvantages, uh, need for a high level of management and poor management can, can have lead to loss of plant growth and uh, a potential yield as well as the risk of salinization. So there are some things that, uh, that are negative about it, but it does have the potential to increase uh, water use efficiency for those looking for that. Now, lastly, I want to talk to you about uh, water application methods for increasing efficiencies. And everybody's seen one of these, maybe not as dramatic on your farm, or maybe it's a valley or a Ranky or a TNL, but uh, these are, are dotted throughout southern Alberta. And this is your standard MISA system. This is a mid elevation spray application. And MISA is about three to six feet above the canopy. So those drops that we're looking at at the top here in the gray, uh, they'd be three to six feet above the canopy and uh, 75 to 90% of application efficiency. A lot of the data now that's coming through is even says that they're about 78 to 80% and less than the high end. And some of us have, have um, thought that it was closer to 85 and in some of the research sets suggests that but uh, I've seen some uh, more recent research coming out of Washington that says it's around 80 percent. Um, eight to ten feet between the drops and uh, six to 30 psi operating pressure. So this is the least efficient of the systems I'm going to show you today. The next one is LIPA or low energy precision application. The top left is the bubbler method, and it just bubbles out of that uh, that nozzle and onto the soil surface. And then the one at the bottom is a drag sock or drag hose, and we just drag the water so with direct contact with the soil. They're about uh, 12 to 18 inches um, above the soil surface for the bubbler, and the drag sock is, of course, a direct contact the spacing though change. So you need to add more drops, um, two and a half to three and a half foot spacings between these drops. 
and our application efficiency is it's closer to the higher end. I know, again, I'm showing you ranges here, but uh, it is closer to the higher end, so about 97%, and six to eight or six to 10 PSI operating pressure. The advantages of LIPA, and the one I'm going to show you moving forward here is uh, precision mobile drip are the most efficient forms of, of pivot irrigation, and they outperform spray applications and deficit irrigation uh, work as well. Uh, the disadvantages, increased insulation costs, to cost, pardon me, because they have more drop tubes, um, increase for runoff potential, which is not good, requires um, filling the soil profile prior to planting, and it's limited by soil type. The next one is LISA. Basically, it's a, a LIPA with a spray nozzle on it. And it is 80, again, to 97% efficient, uh, three or one to three and a half uh, foot installation height, and two and a half to three and a half foot spacings between your drops. And again, this one is six to 10 PSI, but it's not as efficient as our LIPA system is. This is the last one. Oh, no, there's one more after this one. This one is a pre precision mobile drip irrigation or mobile drip irrigation. It has those long tubes, and so the, the tubes be, get are shorter and the closer you get to the center of the pivot, and they have emitters at the end. So we have less emitters the closer we get to the center, and more emitters the closer we get to the end of the pivot. Um, the one thing about this is there was some research done in Kansas that talks about 35% lower uh, soil evaporation rate over LISA, which is the one I just showed you. And they just compared the two systems, like the LISA system, which the spray nozzle is about 18 inches above the soil surface, as well as the PMDI. Direct soil contact for these, um, 80 to 96% efficient. And again, this is probably closer to the higher end, around 96%. And uh, it's it's one of the most efficient ones. And you don't have that uh, the soil evaporation rates that you would have with LISA, again because you're just, uh, you have it spread out over a larger area and your emitters are only six, six inches apart. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about subsurface drip irrigation. It's normally trenched in at about a, a one foot below the soil surface and water is applied directly to the root zone of the crops. It's 98% efficient. It uh, limits wetting the vegetation, less broadleaf weed pressure, pressure, I was going to say potential there. And in terms of water savings, it assumes a water savings of 25% to over center pivot irrigation. And lastly, it irrigates a larger area. Of course, you don't have any misses like you will with a corner system. Even with a, a corner arm running, you're, you're not going to get that whole quarter irrigated. So that is, in a nutshell, all I have to talk to you about today. So I'll review this. So we talked about our rate, amount, and timing of irrigation. And we also talked about our dry land water management, our stubble management, how critical that is. You wanna make sure that you have enough stubble to capture as much uh, snow and uh, winter precipitation as you can. Uh, and you also wanna know, are my fertilizer and fungicide rates realistic? So when I go out in the field and, and I look at how much water storage I have, is it realistic to apply the fertilizer and fungicide rates that I may have? Um, minimize tillage, again, talked about that. Crop mix, how important that is and, and how you can actually utilize a shallow uh, rooted crop uh, in the following years with uh, deeper rooted crops to extract uh, soil moisture at a lower level. And then we talked about irrigation management, uh, our crop water requirements, and uh, managing our water allocation and transfer amounts. And then through our irrigation management strategies, we talked about deficit irrigation and all of its uh, different approaches. And then lastly, our irrigation system improvements, LISA, LIPA, LISA, PMDI, MDI, and SDI. And with that, I guess I'll leave it open for some questions. Thanks, Len. 
Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can either put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and yeah. Well, there is a uh, question in the chat from Ryan. Do you know sure. the cost of drip irrigation versus a pivot approximate? Um, it is definitely more expensive for drip. Uh, subsurface drip you're talking about or a PMDI? I would imagine subsurface drip. Yeah, it is more money. Um, I think the trade-off is how long will your system last? And they're finding down in the U.S. anyway, and they don't have the same kind of winters that we do, but they're finding that the systems can last up 20 to 25 years, and then they do see a benefit if the systems can last that long. If the systems are shorter lived than that, then you're you're definitely not reaping the benefits of that installation. So all right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, but if you do think of them, you can just uh type them in the chat or remember at the end of the webinar. Um, so I'm gonna get Chris here to reintroduce uh Joe and then we'll begin with that. Well, thanks, Len, uh, for your chat on irrigation uh, this evening. Um, if anyone does have any questions or you think of something as uh, maybe Joe sparks a question that you actually have for Len, make sure you put it in the chat. Um, so thanks again, uh, Len, for joining us tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Sure. So, Joe, um, Joe is a agriculture water specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation, and he works out of Lethbridge. Um, and he's been in his role for 25 plus years. So he's got a wealth of knowledge in helping agriculture producers with water supply, water quality, water distribution, and some beneficial management practices and water funding programs. Um, so Joe, welcome back. I see uh, you're up getting your presentation up and going, so I'll turn it over to you. And you're also muted, Joe, just so you know. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you, Joe. Okay. Yeah, get, I don't know, I'm getting an echo. I, I think I'm open twice here. Sorry, folks. Not sure what's going on. Joe, you're not echoing for us, if that's of any help. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Definitely echoing for me. Hmm. Are you able to to go, Joe? Or I'm not not sure. So. I can, I guess, I can take out my earphones here so I don't hear myself. <laughs> um, is, is the is the screen up? Because I can't even. All I can see is a small screen. Yeah, it, it's it's up. So just let me know when you want me to switch. Right now we're on the choosing and securing water supplies. Your first slide. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see if this will work. Um, 
So yeah, so, sorry about all the confusion, folks. I just don't know why I'm having trouble with this technology. But uh, yeah, so as I was introduced, uh, I'm an agriculture water specialist. I work out of Lethbridge and been been there for about well, almost 26 years now. And uh, so I've been working directly with producers and just rural residents, uh, anybody that's uh, looking for support for uh, you know, water supplies and water sources and that sort of stuff. So, wells, uh, wells, et cetera. So, been, been uh, sort of the main thing. So, next slide, please. I can't tell if you're moving the next slide or not. Um, yeah, there you go. You're also in here twice, Joe. That might be the problem. Yeah. But um, you're on the second slide now. Okay. Okay, so... So yeah, so uh, tonight I'll talk about water management and uh, sort of why why we want to, why we should be look by we should have some water management on our farm. Look at uh, you know the reasons such as drip mitigation and crossing. We'll talk about that. Also talk about uh, water management. Uh, you know how we would uh, how would you know look at doing water management. You know by using a long term water management plan, paying attention to our water quality. And things like that. So, um, so is is it is this a problem, Kayla? You're saying it's uh, breaking up. Is am I gonna have to try something different? Are you on two screens, Joe? Actually, no. I don't. I don't see that I am. I only have one screen going. Okay, one second here. I you are in here twice. The one I'm gonna kick you out. Yeah, um, kick one of them out. Okay. Um, now you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Okay, I don't see how to unmute. Oh. Are you there, Joe? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, that's better. I got rid of the echo, so that seemed to work. Perfect. Okay. Okay, that's that's better. So the sound quality better now? Way better. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, finally on the road okay so um so yeah so really why would we you know worry about management well um you know over the years i've been through several of these droughts uh, or these dry cycles and uh the, the calls like we have the the water program which has funding so we've had a funding program since two since the drought of 2001 and every time the it gets dry like this the calls go up dramatically and it's just sort of a sign that the industry is just not that good at getting ready for the next drought because droughts happen here and, you know, planning ahead is you know, really beneficial. Uh, dugouts don't, you know, if you're dry, digging a dugout, uh, you know, this year, it pro, you know, it's not going to fill this year. I'm going to be lucky if it fills next year. If we get a drought next year, it might not fill like, like we had this year. We had no runoffs. So same with water wells even. Water well drillers are so busy that uh, some of them are almost two years out. If you call a water well driller, most of them are at least a year out. So, so, uh, so there's all, all that at play. So planning ahead really, really is advantageous. You know, are, so are you ready for the next drought? If it's wet, if it turns out that we get a lot of rain this year, you should still be working towards, uh, you know, uh, securing your water supplies. So really doing that understanding, you know, what, how much you'll need and understanding that, um, you know, you might have years, this might be a good example of a year where we're going to have forages 
but the dugouts are empty. So, you know, do you have a plan to, to uh, mitigate that, to get through that? You have forages. If you can't, if you don't have water there, you might not be able to use those forages. That's money sitting in your field. So, so really just, it's, it's also about, uh, about making money, about, uh, you know, efficient use of your resources. So, and then using this water resource uh, efficiently really is, you know, super critical. And, uh, you know, uh, I've actually seen a few already this year that the, the dugouts are quite low. In the spring, they were quite low to a point where they could hardly use them. There was maybe a couple of feet of water in there and they could actually use that, but it's been so mucked up because they were allowing their cattle to, uh, to access the dugouts directly and, uh, you know, cause them. And the water quality was very poor because uh, it was mixed, mixed with soil and basically made a mud slurry. And if they were pumping their water out, out with the remote watering system, they'd be able to utilize that. So next slide, please. So, uh, so beyond how, how do we, how do we do, how do we look at doing water management? And so the, uh, we, we actually recommend, you know, developing a long-term water management plan. We have a template for that. It used to be part of our funding program. We used to acquire it. We actually dropped that just because producers weren't really, you know, taking it to heart and actually developing a plan. You're, most of you, I'm sure, do have a plan, but it's just in your head. And obviously, often formalizing it, though, can, can point out uh, some of the deficiencies in your, in your planning. When you do it in your head, sometimes you miss things. And also then you have a plan for if there's other, uh, you know, other folks on the farm, a, you know, a family or hired, uh, hired helpers that, uh, you know, everybody knows where, where you're at and, uh, and how, how you're, you're looking at uh, tackling the situation and making reasonable choices. So, so it's really about, you know, looking at what, uh, you know, predicting what kind of problems you have and shortfalls, those other problems like that, and uh, coming up with a with a actual plan that uh, is is um, you know usable. So, and it just gives you you know then as you change your farm, you've got a you've you've got a home base to work from. So if you add land, uh, you know you can look at well, do we have enough water? Um, where, where we are and the future, future improvements, you might be able to change to, um, you know, rotational grazing or something that's going to add efficiency to your, to your forages. And, uh, but do you have enough water for that? So next slide, please. So really just, uh, you know, what do we do? What is a long-term water management plan? It's just calculate uh, how much water you, you need for each identified use. So well, let me say livestock as an example, and you probably have uh, many, many paddocks, like many pastures. And so each one requires water, obviously. So do you have it in the right place? And uh, what can you do to, to, uh, to have water in that, in that place? Do you have to construct another dugout? Do you have to uh, drill another well, or can you move water uh, via pipeline? I'll talk more about pipelines here in just a minute because because they're really pipelines are often something that uh, producers don't I don't think utilize enough so so really it's just uh, you know making sure you have enough water in in all conditions so a year like this like I said you know these dugouts are often very low and yet uh, we, we have these spring rains so we're probably going to have some decent forages decent decent pasture conditions so uh, next slide please So uh, there's, there's lots of different, uh, or the, the main categories of, uh, of water sources are, are the groundwater, the surface water. So groundwater being water that's down in the soil profile. Um, surface water, so that's the runoff from, from snowfall rain uh, and creeks, things sort of things. Uh, then there's pipelines, which I'll talk about here in some little more detail. And then there's other things such as storage tanks, water hauling, uh, temporary pumping, all that sort of stuff. So, so um, let's see, do I have, do I need to go? Yeah, I better talk about a few of these things. So, 
So water wells, like I said, uh, is probably the most common. Probably, I think, on our funding program, about uh, probably 95% of our applications have been for water wells. And there, there's good reason for that. Water wells are very reliable. Even in dry conditions, it doesn't vary a lot uh, uh, with the surface conditions. So in dry conditions, it takes quite a few years for the aquifers to, to drop in capacity. Uh, where surface water, you're very, um, you know, nuggets are very dependent on, on, uh, on the conditions of the of that year and the year year before. But uh, springs are also, you know, that's groundwater, and uh, so groundwater dugouts is people call them uh, uh, spring fed dugouts, but they're basically just shallow groundwater. So, uh, so those things are, are less affected by uh, by drought. Uh, where surface water is more affected, but uh, surf, uh, dugouts would be the next most common um, method. And so dugouts are a little more problematic to uh, to have. Uh, they're they're susceptible to contamination, to uh, uh, algal problems, to like cyanobacteria, bacteria, um, and those sort of things that that causes uh, water quality problems. And and so water wells are are you know, are, are often are more popular for a reason. They some they cost a little more sometimes than dugouts, but dugouts over the long run can can probably uh, cost almost as much as uh, as water wells. So, so um, and then there's things like uh, um, dams are very difficult to construct. I'm going to talk about that more in the, when I'm talking about the the, the legislation around uh, water, which I'll talk about in the last half of this presentation because uh, a lot of producers don't understand that. So uh, dams are very difficult to uh, to construct legally. And then there's sloughs and creeks and those sort of stuff that uh, that I'm sure some of you, some of you use. Um, so I'll take this opportunity to talk about pipelines because I've mentioned it several times already. So uh, uh, pipelines are just where we're moving water from somewhere where we have a good secure source and, uh, and uh, moving it to somewhere where we need it. And so the, the most generally what I'm talking about here is uh, usually shallow bury pipelines where it's plowed in and uh, producers have been reluctant to, to do that. They don't think they think it's going to cost a lot, but pipelines can be often one of the least expensive way of getting water uh, where you need it. It can be plowed in, uh, you know, some, uh, a lot of this black poly pipe is typically two bucks a foot and you can go quite a ways, uh, you know, you know, a mile is, uh, you know, 5,000 feet plus kind of thing. So for $10,000, you can move water a mile. And uh, you don't need huge, uh, huge pipelines. A lot think that you need a lot bigger than, um, I have pipelines that are two miles long that are an inch and a half. It, it does it does limit the volume for sure. But uh, if you have a large tank or trough at the other end, uh, it, it can definitely be viable. And then they also worry about freezing in the winter. They, they just don't want the problems of blowing it out every every fall. And uh, you don't have to blow them out. The uh, poly pipe will, can freeze right full of water and not be a problem. The only problems you'll have is fittings and, and maybe the float valve at the other end, that sort of stuff. But the pipe itself uh, can easily withstand freezing. It, it will, it will uh, poly tubes uh, in a presentation they do us, they'll take about... Uh, about a 10% expansion without it rupturing and water only freezes, it expands about 6%. So, so they're usually not a problem. Um, and then there's things like water co-ops and these regional pipelines. Some of them, uh, some of them don't allow livestock watering. It's for household water only, but some of them do allow. So if you have one in your area, you want to, you know, you want to check that out. Um, and, and the producer sometimes balk at some of these costs, the, uh, you know, to join, you know, 20,000 or something like that to, uh, to join a membership. But, um, you know, that sounds like a lot of money, but when you start comparing it, a, a well now, you can't construct much of a well for 20,000 anymore. So when you start comparing it to that, and then the long-term maintenance of those things, you know, uh, often these, uh, these regional uh, water co-ops are often not that, are quite cost, can be cost effective. So I mentioned turbinary pipelines. You know, that's like in the category of maybe rolling out a, for temporarily just rolling out some, some uh, poly pipe. 
uh, for a temporary thing or uh, accessing our water pumping program uh, to move water to a dugout or some area where, where you need it. Then there's uh, you know, uh, water hauling and storage tanks. Uh, this year we've seen, I've had more questions about that than we've had in a while, again, because we've got low dugouts and some areas there, there is not good uh, well water. There's, there, there's, it's pretty difficult to, to construct a good well. So, uh, and the dugouts are dry, but yet they have, they have good grass. So, so um, uh, sometimes, sometimes the most viable uh, method is just actually hauling some water to a storage tank. And it's not fun hauling water, but, but it can, you know, that, that grass out there is, is worth good money. So sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So next slide, please. So, um, you know, just, I think we went backwards, didn't we? I guess we didn't. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, so really just, just identify your, um, uh, you know, your, your current water supplies, what's, what's out there. Just look at the reliability, look at the water quality. Um, you know, do you have legal access to it? Things like that. So, uh, so really just the, Developing a good water source uh, and and and, and piping water is uh, is often a really good way of looking at it, uh, rather than trying to punch uh, water wells all over the place or dig dugouts all over the place. Um, sometimes just developing one good water source and piping it where you need it is is a, is a good alternative. So, next slide, please. So I just wanted to mention about the water uh, pumping program. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if, if some of you may know about it, some of you may not. Uh, the Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation has a, a program where we have uh, a six inch main line and uh, these power takeoff uh, powered pumps. So it's, uh, it's, you can rent from us. It's $200 a day for the pump and $300 a day for the first mile of, uh, of pipe. And so if, if you need an additional pump or additional trailers, they're half, half that price. So, um, and, it, and when you rent it, we, we bring it out to you and deliver it out to the site. You have to set it up, uh, use your tractor. You have to operate it. And then when you're done, you pick the pipe back up and put it on the trailer and call us and we come and we'll come and pick it up again. And, uh, the, that rental rate is per pumping day. So it's a 24 hour day. So if you're pumping two 12 hour days, that's one day. And, uh, so we, we look at, uh, what you're pumping into and we do look at what you're, where you're pumping from and what you're pumping into, because, um, if you're pumping from a public water body, so that's a, Lake, river, creek, slough even, that's, that's a public water source. And uh, you will need a temporary diversion license from Alberta Environment. If you're pumping from a private dugout, a man-made uh, structure, so that also includes irrigation canals because uh, that, that water is already licensed, then uh, you can uh, just go ahead and, and uh, you, know, you won't need a temp. A temp uh, TDL, a temporary diversion license. So to, to rent it, uh, to, to give us a call at, uh, 310 farm. That's what we recommend. The direct number actually is that 780-422-5000, but you don't need to remember that. If you phone the 310 farm, they'll put you through to that 422-5000 number and that'll go directly to our team. It's run out of Lethbridge, but we have drivers across the province. We have uh, four drivers across the province, uh, stationed throughout the province. Next slide, please. Okay, switching gears uh, to um, talk about uh, the Water Act, because this is where there's uh, uh, producers often have, uh, uh, don't understand some of the things that, that uh, they should in regards to water. So... So uh, we have uh, a water act that's um, uh, the, the minister, minister, ministry and responsible is Alberta Environment and Protected Areas, uh, EPA for short. And uh, 
the current water act came in january 1st of 1999 so really not much has changed since january 1st of 99 and i get producers saying hey what's this new stuff it's not new uh, as long as uh, you know january 1st of 99 is when it came into force um it really emphasizes the wise use uh, and allocation of water um and it's uh, water has always been owned by the crown so if you have a slough on your property that's wholly on your own property, uh, you don't own that water. You actually, you don't own any water. You don't own the water that's, uh, you know, coming out of the tap in your kitchen. You buy a bottle of water from the convenience store. You're not buying water. You're buying, you're not, you're, you're buying the packaging of it and that because all Albertans have a right to access water, and uh, so it's it's owned by it's owned by everyone, and. Uh, so, so how does this work with the agriculture industry? Um, we just, uh, it really, the, the Water Act, you know, secures certain rights and access to all Albertans, including agriculture. So uh, it's, it's uh, divvied out through the water licensing process. So the water licensing process is what we use to obtain water rights because you, you obtain certain rights through the licensing process. Next slide, please. So uh, there's, um, uh, I guess, uh, three main categories. So house, household use is the first category and probably the most important because all, all Albertans have a right to access, uh, access water for their, for their families, for their household use. So as domestic use, household use uh, means the same thing. It's usually, it's usually called, uh, referred to as domestic use. And so that's for uh, human consumption, sanitation, fire prevention, uh, and watering your, 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 uh, your garden, watering your pet dog, watering your pet horse, watering your pet cow, watering your pet 40 cows. Because uh, you, uh, under the, under the Water Act, you have a right to access uh, uh, two, 275,000 gallons per year, uh, or, or 1.25 uh, decameters. And um, that's, that's enough water. Most households use about 40,000 gallons a year. So that's why, you know, you, got, you can water your pet, uh, you know, 40 cows kind of thing for, for the year. So for a household well, if you're using under, use, using under 275,000 gallons, um, you can do that without any licensing. So, and I'll talk about licensing uh, beyond that here in just a moment. So there's also traditional agriculture use. So so uh, there is a category people call them, uh, people phone me all the time talking about, uh, you know, I want to register my uh, water use. Um, well, you could, they had a one time, a one year period you know, when they first introduced the new water act, they, they had to recognize the, the traditional use because at one time agriculture did not, uh, did not license water. They kind of ignored the uh, most uh, agriculture operations and didn't require them to license. So they have they give the opportunity for um, producers to register their amount of water based on when they first used started using it. So it might have been your, their grandfather started using it in you know 1905, uh, a certain water source such as a creek or or a well or whatever they could actually license uh, or they could register that use and it was basically a, a quasi license that 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 registration stays with the land no matter what. So if you sell the land, it stays with the land. What our licensing actually doesn't, it's actually, it's licensed to the, the person or the organization and they have the ability to separate that. But uh, uh, water registration does, does, it can't be separated from the land. Next slide, please. So the main, the main category for agriculture now, and so after 2001, that ended. There was no more, there, there was no more opportunity to register. That, that, that ended at the December 31st of 2001. So, um, so now how do, you, how do you secure your water rights? And that's through a, a water license. And um, so, so under that, you, you can apply for a water license to divert a, uh, uh, specified amount of water so that's and that is based on what you're planning on using it for and uh, 
and you you can register you can license that to apply for a license uh there are there are restrictions in the south saskatchewan river basin uh, there's a moratorium on any new licenses so in the south saskatchewan river basin which probably many of us on this uh, on this webinar are part of there's there's no new licenses how there is there is still some exemptions for traditional agriculture use so if you're uh using uh, uh, water under, uh, out of a dugout that's uh, under um, 550,000 gallons, uh, you can use that uh, without a license. And, um, and uh, if you're diverting from a, a, a creek or a slough that, that traditionally had um, uh, grazing on it, then you can pump that water out and uh, without without a, a license. So it's basically there is still some traditional agriculture use, but you don't you don't really retain any rights. It just you're just allowed to use that. So and then this is, gets fairly com it can be very complex, a lot, lot more complex than the time I have in this webinar. But uh, if you want to know more about it, you can you can call me. So okay, next slide, please. So this license is really a license to divert. So what that is, is it gives you the rights to use that water. So a specified amount of water and then uh, with, with uh, specific uses and, uh, and provides that right to access based on the date of application. So, uh, so it's first in time, first in rights. So older licenses, licenses of people that licensed before in in times of dry conditions, uh, people from before can can uh, ha have a higher right to access that water, and so that actually came into play this year with the dry conditions. Uh, that's why these water sharing agreements came in because the irrigation districts have old licenses and they could potentially hold the water from from everybody, all the cities and everything. So they chose to graciously allow uh, water sharing agreements. So uh, thank you to the irrigation districts. Um, so, uh, so the license is the license is the ability to use that water, but if you need to construct something, uh, you'll need an approval. So if you need to move that water from one place to another or construct a, uh, uh, dugout or whatever, uh, then you may require an approval. So it's an approval to do. So you can imagine if you wanted to start, uh, if you wanted to build a dam on a Creek or something, you would need an approval to do that because uh, to, to conduct an activity is how Alberta environment uh, refers to it. And so that's really when you're developing any structure, doing any excavation, that sort of stuff. There again, there are actually um, exemptions and uh, schedule one has some exemptions uh, that allow uh, uh, dugouts to be constructed on lands as long as there's only one dugout per quarter. So it only allows for that, that one, one dugout, et cetera. So, so there is, there is some complexity around that, but uh, there is some ability to to uh, do some work without an approval. So, so yeah. So Schedule One um, uh, isn't required uh, for uh, placing, constructing, maintaining, or filling a dugout in unless the dugout or it is it uh, unless the dugout is in a water course or is in a wetland. So if it's in a water course or a wetland, then you do need uh, an, you do need an approval. Or if uh, the change, or if it changes the uh, flow of water to adjacent parcels. So if you're, you know, basically starving somebody else out, uh, then you would need an approval. Um, if it's in the same water course and parcel land as the existing dugout. So that's where you can only construct one dugout per quarter unless you have an approval. You can do the second one, but you will need to get an approval for that from Alberta Environment. It also, if it's more than 2,500 cubic meters in size, which is 550,000 gallons, if you want it bigger than that, then you will need an approval for that. And this is sort of a repeat. It's, those, it's in the same water course, parcel land as existing dugout, same, same thing as I said before. Or if there is a restricted uh, area water management plan, and uh, there, I'm not sure if there's any in this area that that affect dugouts. I uh, the 
the South Saskatchewan River Basin does have an area water management plan, but it does allow for uh, Schedule One to uh, these exemptions I just mentioned to to be to be used. So, so uh, you can construct a dugout in the South Saskatchewan River Basin. Next slide, please. So licenses also has uh, has a uh, some exemptions uh, with Schedule Three, uh, and so it's uh, our. Of, uh, if licenses are required if the for dugouts if it's pumped into the dugouts so that's so an example of that is if we're using our uh, uh, water pumping program uh, if you're pumping water into it then you'll need a temporary diversion license unless that water already uh, has a license applied to it and uh, such as uh, another private dugout that sort of thing so or if the dugout is more than uh, 12,500 cubic meters, so a fairly large dugout, um, or if the or if the diversion out of the dugout, so the use out of the dugout is more than 1.375 million gallons, so per year. So again, if it's restricted uh, by an uh, area water management plan, and you just need to know that licenses don't doesn't guarantee access to water; it only allows you to use the water if it's there. And as I mentioned, it's uh, based on first in time, first in right. And you need to remember that household has priority over all licenses. So if you have an early license, but some household needs that water, they actually have the higher right. Okay, next slide. So, so applying for either a license or an approval, um, you can, uh, Alberta Environment has an online uh, application system now. They changed it from their paper system to a digital system called Digital Regulatory Assurance System. Um, it's relatively new. It's about two years old, but uh, we're still getting used to it. Alberta Environment's even still getting used to it. So there is some assistance to, uh, to help with that. Alberta Environment have, uh, have actually got some people to help them help you uh, make applications now. So better than it was uh, last year. So you need to know that it, it is, there is a bit of online work you have to do. You'll need uh, My Alberta Digital ID. Um, so that's often referred to as Maddie or Maddie B accounts. So because there's a Maddie B is just a business account. Your your Maddie number is your own personal one, and that's that's getting used more and more. I know it's used for in the healthcare system um, that number. So some of you may already have that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm down to pretty well to the end. Um, just. Uh, you know we have lots of resources online so there is uh there is a ton of resources we have water quality information tool the rural water quality information tool we call it rocket for short um there's different calculators there's uh, dugout sizing calculators that sort of stuff and actually the links to probably all these you can find on this uh uh, uh farming and dry conditions so if you want to take out your phone and take a Photograph of those, um, those are, or contact us or do a search for them. Uh, there is lots of information uh, on here. Um, everything that I've talked about is on there. Um, and, and uh, but, but we have lots of stuff online. Now, it's sometimes not the easiest to find. So if you're looking for something specific and you can't find it, by all means, give me a call or any of the other water specialists. Um, Best way to get me is through 310 Farm, and if you don't get me, uh, there's uh, three other water specialists in the province, So, and we work wherever. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, today I was helping somebody from Peace River, and uh, Pervez was helping somebody from down here. Just uh, we, we try to kind of work um, in our areas, but often uh, we, we try to, we just, whoever's available uh, will help anybody in the province, so. So you can call me at 310 Farm, but there's my direct number, uh, 381-5846, if uh, the 403 number. Uh, feel free to give me a call anytime. We're here to try to help you. And I think uh, that's it. Okay, anybody got any questions? Yeah, thanks, Joe. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat or just unmute yourself.
I don't think so at this time. Oh. Ryan asked, how long does it take to get an approval to dig a dugout bigger than 250? Yeah, um, so that is an Alberta, that it depends on Alberta environment. So if you're looking for funding, um, so Sonia is going to talk about funding here in a bit. And, uh, um, and uh, so if there's any questions for her that uh, she can answer, that's, that's a program I work with every day. Um, so there is funding for dugouts um, you know, through the water program, and it does require a go ahead from us first. Uh, we used to sometimes call them approval, but approval isn't correct because the approvals is actually Alberta environment. So if you're talking about digging something that the Alberta environment needs to approve, I don't know. Uh, using this DRAS system has really sped things up. It was often months and months getting an approval. And now I think it's down to a month or two. So it is probably a couple of months. If you're wanting to dig it out this year that does need approval, you need to get on it right away so you can, you can, construct it before the ground gets too frozen. So it doesn't happen immediately. So that's a good question. All right, Sonia, I'll let you go ahead then. Okay, it sounds good. I'll just share this again. And everybody see my screen? Yeah, you yes. can see it. Cool. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sonia Bloom. I'm the environmental coordinator with the Hills Forage and Grazing Association. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, in my days in the office actually helping producers understand and guide them through these programs. Uh, I'm going to come at you guys with a lot of information really, really fast and really hot and furiously. So please ask questions or be sure to take my number and give me a call um, afterwards if you have more questions. So um, the funding that I'm going to talk about is specific for watering systems. Um, there are additional programs for other things as well, but um, the one I'm going to focus on here is our water system funding. So we'll quickly go through the SCAP water program, which covers both the on-farm irrigation and on-farm water supply. And we're pretty lucky to have both Len and Joe here. So if there are specific questions that come up and I can't answer them, this is amazing timing to uh, get them for some clarification. Um, we'll also talk about the SCAP RELP, so Resilient Agriculture Landscape Program. And specifically, there's six BMPs that deal with water systems. And then we'll talk a little bit about the uh, off-calf rotational grazing uh, BMP, which also has funding for watering systems. And then just a few of the more local uh, in, or regional area funds available. So the first one is the Farm Water Program. Uh, this program, it aims to help producers adopt egg water management practices for your guys' growth and for long-term success of the industry as a well. whole. The first one we'll talk about is the on-farm irrigation stream. Um, I'm just gonna lower, perfect, there we go. Uh, so this one gives us cost share funding for irrigation purchases and upgrades. So all these are gonna be cost shared 50-50 grant, 50-50 U. Um, under this program, each producer can qualify for up to 35,000 maximum per fiscal year of the program. So SCAP, Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership, was launched in 2023 and it's going to go until 2028. So that's 35,000 maximum for the next uh, three years of the program. And uh, if you are doing purchases of like a low pressure center pivot system or a subsurface drip system, you can get up to 17,500 per parcel. And then 50% cost share for upgrades. So, and that's up to $6,000 per parcel. So for purchases, what does that look like? So for a low pressure center pivot, any system, it has to be an upgrade from like your gravity side wheel or a high pressure system. And it has to be on a parcel that's at least 20 acres. Your subsurface drip irrigation system, it's the same thing. It's an upgrade from a gravity, a side wheel, a high pressure, or if you're upgrading a low pressure system into an even more efficient subsurface drip system, you can get um, the funds available for that. And again, this is 17,500 per parcel. 
your upgrades. So this is up to $6,000 per parcel. These are things like if you need to upgrade your low pressure center pivot. So maybe you have a low pressure system, but you want to buy a more efficient system, then um, you can get, or you're gonna retrofit a high pressure system to a low pressure system uh, that qualifies in this one. Your surface drip system. So a purchase and installation of a new surface drip system, at least 10 acres. Sprinkler packages. So if you're looking to upgrade your sprinkler packages and you have a high efficient nozzle with your efficiency rating of at least greater than or equal to 85%, then those are eligible. Your pumps and pump modifications. So high efficiency water pumps and your electric motors to replace your older, less efficient ones. And then any modifications to make an existing pump more compatible with a, or compatible with a low pressure center pivot. Those are eligible. And then any control panel upgrades. And those have to be on systems that are at least 10 acres. <clears throat> okay, so that was real quick, the irrigation. Now we'll talk about farm water supply stream. So we have two different streams we're gonna talk about in this one, your standard incentives for new or expanded water sources, and then your special incentives. So some important notes on these programs, uh, $20,000 maximum over the entire program term. So that's the whole five years, 20,000 maximum. It's 50% cost share for standard incentives. So you pay 50, you get 50 back from the grants. And then there's a few special incentives we'll talk about at the end, well decommissioning, well pit conversions and wetland assessments. So our standard incentives, this again, 50% cost share up to a maximum $20,000 over the life of the program. Things like wells. So this is construction of a new well, and it's now on a sliding scale depending on the depth. So anywhere from by from ten thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars per well. The twenty thousand dollars is for wells that are drilled. I believe it's five hundred feet or more um, dugouts. So if you are doing a construction of a new or expanding an existing dugout. Same thing, you can get up to $10,000 for that water source. Um, a couple important notes on those ones. Uh, this does not cover things like cleaning out dugouts. I get that question quite often. Um, and you also have to protect the dugout from direct access uh, direct from your livestock. And so that also, um, there, there's funds available for fencing and offsite watering systems. We'll talk about that soon. Spring development, so if you're developing a spring, um, you can get up to 50%. And then dams, so constructing of a new dam. So that's an earthen structure in a water course to hold water back. Now the dugouts, the spring developments, the dams, and I think there's one more coming up. They You have to have an approval from EPA before you can begin the projects. And so Joe was talking about that and you can connect with an AGI water specialist who can help provide you more information on that. Um, okay, so here we go. Tie into a multi-user water supply. So when Joe was talking about the municipal pipelines or water co-ops, um, that is this here. So you can get up to $10,000, 50% cost shared for those activities. If you have a cistern that's also part of a permanent watering system within a farm site, and it's a permanent cistern, then you can get up to $10,000, 50% for your uh, cistern. Your water source for crop irrigation. So if you need to develop a water source and you're not in an irrigation district and you have a water license, then you can get up to $10,000 uh, to develop a water source for that irrigation. Uh, unshared water pipeline. So these are uh, on your private property. So if you have a deeper, shallow buried pipeline and you're trying to extend from an existing developed water source across your property to another property farmed by you, or it's a minimum distance of 300 meters, then you can get um, those are, they qualify for funding under this program. And then this last one I'm very excited about is uh, off source watering system on constructed water sources. So um, you can now get up to $5,000 on existing dugouts if you wanted to fence them off and put on uh, off site watering systems and then up to $10,000 on a newer expanded dugout. So if you are building a new dugout and one of the requirements is you have to fence it off and put on a remote watering system, you can get up to 50% of those funds. And then if you have an existing water source or existing dugout and you wanna fence it off and put on a watering system, you can do that. I'm very excited about this addition and uh, I wanted to point this out and say thanks to Joe and the team for hearing producers as this is a common 
a common wish that we were hoping for. So very happy to see this. And then the special incentives. So think of the special incentive as a separate $20,000 uh, that you could apply for. These are things like your well de decommissioning. So it's a it's an increasing scale. So if you decommission one well, you can get 50% get cost share back, 60 for two wells, and 75% for three or more wells, up to a total of $12,000 for well decommissioning under this. So maximum grant for wells, um, if the wells are 500 feet, less than 500 feet deep, you can get up to $2,000 for that decommissioning. And if your wells are greater than or equal to 500 feet deep, then you can get up to $6,000. Wetland assessments. So if you have to um, get a consult or an assessment on a, for a dugout that you want to build or a dam you want to build that may potentially impact the wetlands, then you can get up to $2,000, 50% cost share for that wetland assessment. It's important to note that you have to talk to a water specialist like Joe Harrington for this activity. And then the well pit conversion is similar to well decommissioning. It's 50% for one well, 60 for two, and 75 for three or more. So if you have a well that's in a well pit and you want to convert it by putting in a pitless adapter and getting it out of the ground, then um, this, you can get some funds for this activity. Uh, you have to make sure though that when it is complete, the well is not located in a pump house after completion. Okay, so that was water. Now we're gonna talk about RELF or Resilient Agriculture Landscape Program. Um, and I also just wanna quickly point out that the program is closed for this year. They um, got a huge, or a huge amount of interest and uh, applications have now ended, but I wanted to give you guys this information so that you can be prepared and ready to throw in your application for when it opens on February 1st, 2025. So, RELP is that it aims to support producers in conserving and enhancing environmental resilience on your egg landscaping or agricultural landscapes. How it works is you can get up to 100% of eligible expenses covered. And this idea is to support producers in your ability to implement and maintain a BMP project over a three year term. Producers may qualify for up to $150,000 in funding and then applications will open again February 1st, 2025. There is a number of beneficial management practices that you can get funding for under RELP, but the six that we're going to talk about a bit more are this, your riparian area management, your rotational grazing, your annual cropland conversion, and your intercropping, which all allows you to get funding for off-site watering systems. And then under the shelter belts and the establishment of pollinator strips, you can get funding for your irrigation system and components for that. How... Um, how RELP works, I don't have a slide for this, sorry guys, is you get a per acre amount and that is determined by what it's gonna cost you for those implementations. So you say how much it's gonna cost you for those watering systems, the fencing, your seed, anything that's eligible and you put in your application, it spits out a per acre amount and they pay you 50% at application approval and then 50% at the end of the three years as long as you maintain your project. So are you eligible for SCAP? If you are a farm producing at least 25,000 in farm commodities annually, if for the water and irrigation program, you own an irrigated egg operation in Alberta, and if you're applying under RELP, you have a current environmental farm plan, then you are eligible for these funds. Okay, we're gonna quickly talk about OFCAF, the On-Farm Climate Action Funds. There's a few different groups that are administering this program, but I'm just gonna talk about ARDAR OFCAF because it is still currently open and accepting applications. If you are interested in funding or in applying for this, please, please get on your application right away. I imagine this, this will also be filling up pretty quick. So how OFCAF works is uh, they provide up to 85% cost share funds. So a maximum of 75,000 per producer from April 1st, 2022 to March 31st, 2025. It has to be a new BMP project. So it has to either be onto a new field in your farm or new to the farm in general. And then you have to be working with a PA or CCA. So they have to help you develop and sign off on your uh, BMP action plan. 
The BMP that we're going to talk about is the rotational grazing one. So the, under this, you can get funding for shallow water distribution systems, which includes your pipelines, your remote watering systems, as long as it's uh, powered by renewable energy. It has to be part of an improved rotational grazing system. So you have to um, show an improvement over current state. Other eligible costs under this is your under, sorry, off calf is the fencing material and installations your BMP action plan development. So the, if you get charged by the PA or CCA, then up to $2,000 back for that. Um, custom installation and equipment rentals. So no in-kind eligible under this program. And then costs for seed and rental equipment. So if you are wanting to also improve the legume composition of your pasture, then you can also get, I think it's up to $85 per acre for that. It's important to note that if you are approved and through rotational grazing and you submit invoices for water system alone, they will not reimburse your project. You have to accrue or you have to incur other expenses, including the fencing and your um, your agronomic support. So eligibility and details. So if you're a farmer, farm that produces 25,000 in farm commodity annually, uh, it's important to note that you have to have an approval letter from OFCAF before you implement your BMP. And uh, rented land is allowed with permission. So a few local funding opportunities. And this is one of my favorite photos. Um, it was at one of our field days a few years back um, in which um, I, I absolutely love just how clean the water is that like, numerous people were drinking out of the trough. So just improves how important good water is. So a few uh, more regional opportunities would be under like the ALICE, so the Alternative Land Use Services. Uh, this isn't a program that's available in all municipalities. So I would definitely encourage you to talk with your egg services, egg service board or your uh, municipal egg services and see if they are an ALICE community. Um, Alice pays a per acre allotment to producers for ecological goods and services. So that's things like carbon sequestration, enhanced biodiversity, um, soil salinity management. It could be soil erosion protection um, and rotational grazing, things like keeping water clean. So they're a charitable organization that um, builds nature-based solutions on your land to sustain agriculture and biodiversity for the benefit of future generations and our current community. The really neat thing about Alice is their community-focused programs. So they are there to aim address like address specific concerns within an area. So a good example is Wheatland County is an Alice community, and when we meet, I'm on the uh, Alice Pack, so that's Producer Action Committee. We get to review the um, applications that come in or the projects and um, make sure that they make sense and that they're gonna create a benefit. So it's very local and very focused program that's giving direct benefit to your communities. Ducks Unlimited Canada also provides some funding for wetland restoration. So if you have a drained wetland and you want to restore it, so then you should definitely reach out and chat with them. It is a 10-year lease and they pay fair market value for wetland acres. They will pay 50% of that in year one and then the remaining 50% gets spread out between years two and 10. And this program is available anywhere in the province. And then other opportunities that maybe people don't think about are from our local egg service boards. Uh, so I only looked through a few um, in the area I think Wheatland, Rocky View, Mountain View, uh, Starlands, just to kind of see, oh, and um, Newell, just to see like what's available. And in general, uh, lots of programs on well decommissioning and well pit conversions. A few of those counties are Alice communities. There's a few that also offer funds in the watershed resiliency and restoration programs. There's the various stewardship programs. They all generally are the same idea they want to enhance ecological goods and services. So things like RELP uh, or projects, sorry, that are similar to RELP, things like fencing, remote watering system, seeding projects, shelter or shelter belts, pollinator strips, native seeding projects. If it's a stewardship program, then you should connect with your local municipality and see if there's funds for it. And then lots also offer shelter belt programs. 
So like I said, quick, fast, lots of information at you. Um, this is my information. If you want, I encourage you to take a quick photo of this screen because I'm going to switch to one more slide and in it is a bunch of QR codes with the websites for these programs if you want more information. So I'll just give you guys a second on this slide. Um, but yeah, I um, I am also an environmental farm plan technician. So if you need to work on your environmental farm plan as part of funding and um, you don't know how to get started, give me a call and we can get, get you going in that process. And then here is that last slide real quick, just with um, just with the websites for each each of those um, programs that I talked about. So um, yeah, that's a real quick presentation. And um, if you have any questions, please let us know. The water program did just change too. So a few of those, if it's felt a little choppy, I'm still figuring out what those changes are. Thanks, Anya. <clears throat> yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you do think of them later, you do have her information to contact her. Um, yeah. So I guess that wraps up our webinar for this evening. I do want to thank uh, Chris and Trish with Connect First Credit Union, as well as Joe and Len and Sonia for speaking. Um, I will be sending out the recording of this webinar in the next few days. Uh, so it will be coming through your email, but it will also be on our website. So thanks, everybody.